Did the electric car die because of battery technology? Did EVs really not have enough range? And did car companies use the best batteries available? Battery technology at that time was lead-acid batteries and allowed the car to go 60 miles. If you started out on a trip knowing that you were going to go dead in 60 miles, you'd be nervous about making the trip. For those who wanted greater range from an EV 100 miles or more, a better battery already existed, developed by a well-known inventor working in Troy, Michigan, about 30 miles from General Motors headquarters. I'm standing. And Iris Oshinsky. I think you shouldn't do it that way. You should say you're Stan Oshinsky and I'll say I'm Iris Oshinsky. Don't do it that way. That's funny. With over 200 patents to his name, Stan Oshinsky had pioneered a new battery and GM purchased controlling share of his company. We were chosen over 60 different uh, big companies like Westinghouse and others who wanted to uh, win the race to make the batteries that would uh, be used in pure electric cars. And we were chosen because we had a battery. And uh, to us, putting it into a car was not the most gigantic thing. What did we were supposed to do? But you uh, did sort of expect champagne and roses. I expected champagne and roses. They when I said that we were going to put in a paragraph into a newspaper that said we had achieved this. I really expected congratulations to flow in. And then I knew that something was different when the opposite happened. Oshensky was censured for publicizing his battery advances without permission and asked not to run advertising in national publications. The EV-1 debuted with a weaker battery. It would be another two years before Oshinsky's batteries were installed in the EV-1. The first version of the EV-1 had defective Delco batteries in them and they kept failing. So that was GM's failure on those batteries. Once they put good batteries in, they didn't have any problems. Ultimately, GM sold its share in Oshinsky's company to an unlikely buyer. Then when the nickel metal hydride batteries were improved so that they're now lasting longer than the life of the car and cheaper than an engine, Chevron Texaco stepped in and purchased control from General Motors of Oshinsky technology. The oil companies do not feel threatened by battery technology because they effectively crushed it. The, the, you know, the electric car is kind of an interesting case study. I mean, it, it, it was such an abysmal failure that I think there are a lot of people involved in the initial decision making are trying to are, are pointing fingers at that whose responsibility it is. What the oil companies feared is that electric vehicles would would become successful six years from now. What the automobile companies feared was that they'd be losing money on electric vehicles in the next six months. Even as car companies made electric cars, they fought them at every step. What was their motive? Why were they so determined to take them off the road? I mean, I think in the beginning, General Motors didn't believe the car was going to catch on. I don't think they thought they'd ever have to worry about something like a conspiracy to keep it from happening. They hated the mandate. They hated it so much that they ended up not even really wanting to be in the business of EVs. What I frankly detected was a huge resentment about being told what type of motor vehicle had to be made. And it became a fight of principle rather than one of trying to uh, actually technologically solve the problem. I do know that uh... I was surprised at some of the stances they took in Sacramento in arguing. 1995 memo, the American Automobile Manufacturers Association sought to hire a PR firm to manage a so-called grassroots and educational campaign to create a climate to repeal the mandate. The challenge, according to the document, was greater consumer acceptance of electric vehicles. Why would the car companies campaign so hard against their own creation? I made the case at the General Motors board that the reason for the EV1 was to give General Motors a very big head start in how you transform electricity into the drive power for the car. And we give them two, three years lead. And in my judgment, it did. But my frustration was they did not capitalize on the lead. And the reason 
which was discussed at the board, was that there was not a profit seen to be coming out of either electric cars or hybrids. They could not understand how Toyota could possibly make a profit out of the Prius, for example. They were going to lose their shirt. And as evidence have shown, uh, I don't think Toyota is losing their shirt. It had no internal combustion engine, the cornerstone of the auto industry. These parts represent a large part of a dealership's income through the, uh, the replacement and the maintenance. Essentially, this group of parts is a visual representation of the profits that the auto industry doesn't make when they sell an EV1 or an EV in general. I can actually identify a lot of these that didn't get used on the EV1 program. You know, oil filters you need four times a year. That was probably the most prominent thing along with the several quarts of oil every time. I didn't enjoy working on internal combustion engines just due to the fact you got so dirty. And working on the EV1, I'd basically go home looking like this. Uh, servicing the EV1 was uh, pretty simple. It came in about every 5,000 miles. We'd put it in the air. We'd uh, rotate the tires, add washer fluid to it, and send it back out on the street. It's amazing, look how dirty I've gotten just in handling this stuff. <laughs> it's kind of sad. In order to sincerely market a clean car, you have to suggest that your core product is dirty and that it uses oil and that it uses gas and that it increases our dependence on foreign oil. And here's this product that doesn't. It looks very schizophrenic, but I think it, when it started, it, we're, we can show the people in California we can meet the zero emission requirements. And later on, so do we want to show them that we can meet it? That means all of our other cars. But the more it caught on, the more that there was this dichotomy between clean and efficient and non-polluting versus a suburban. Car companies had convinced themselves that they could not make money in the short term with the electric car. In order to do that, they would need an entirely different vehicle. General Motors made a commitment to the Hummer because they could see the Hummer would make them money. When the SUVs first came out, people were like, I can't drive what? that. That big old Special thing? Ladies, that's a tank. I can't see out of that. I'm going to murder somebody in that. That's, ooh, that's too that's big. That's too big for me. But they convinced people, this is you safer. Need this you need this a, a big car. car. You need this Bigger, for your family. Safer. The idea of a, uh, of a penny-pinching EV1 that was super green, you know, that didn't get a lot of traction, whereas the idea of a gigantic uh, SUV that would, you know, crush your neighbor, that did get a lot of traction. Basically, that tells us what the 90s was about. What began as a $25,000 tax break grew to $100,000 when Congress passed the president's economic stimulus package last spring. We think small businesses need to have support at this time to keep them afloat, to keep the economy moving ahead. But there's an encouragement for the small business person, not just to stay afloat, but to go buy the biggest gas guzzler <laughs> there is, the 6,000-pound car, the biggest. Does that make sense? I, I don't think we can, we can dictate what vehicles people buy. I think the goal this here is... This is encouraging them. I mean, you can almost buy the whole car for the tax break. Well... <laughs> I, I'm not going to concede that that would be the way these would be used or that... Well, there's some would, evidence that is how they're being used. Well, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what, what happens.